And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start to, uh, to introduce him. So he's a local New York City poker legend. He attended Trinity High School where he set a number of basketball records uh, before heading to Cornell and then Wall Street. Uh, somehow though he ended up on the poker tables and he actually became the first person to win two million in sit and go games before anyone had even won uh, one million. Um, and then in 2009, I think, he competed in the world, well, he's competed in the World Series of Poker several times. In 2009, he won the Borgata WPT Poker Open, defeating the largest field in history. Uh, and I've known Olivier for the past couple of years, um, and I felt that po and learning poker from a poker pro would be fun, it would be a unique experience for us, and I also believe that poker, as with other sports, uh, have a lot in common with business and the way you live life. So uh, everyone put it together for Olivier, who's here today to talk to us. How you doing, guys? Um, I just want to say I'm honored that Vasu thought that I could bring value to you all um, on your day today. Um, so let me just get started. For for anyone who's you know, flip through the channels, you've probably at some point or another um, gotten to a point where you've seen a bunch of people sitting around a poker table Thank you. Um, playing cards. And if you've ever wondered kind of why poker has had this incredible surge in popularity over the last 10 or 15 years, um, you kind of have to go back to 2003. In 2003, a young accountant from Tennessee, um, I don't know if you guys know who this guy guys I'm talking about, his name is Chris Moneymaker, he couldn't really make his name up. Um, but this guy, Chris Moneymaker, like I said, he was an accountant, and he played an online poker satellite tournament. Now, a satellite tournament is a tournament um, that if you do well, then you get entry into an additional tournament. So he put up $200, and he ended up getting a seat at the World Series of Poker main event. Now, the World Series of Poker main event is the biggest poker tournament all year. It's played in Vegas every year in July, and it's $10,000 to buy into. So a guy like Chris Moneymaker would never have played in the tournament, never put up $10,000 of his own money, but because he won this satellite, he got a seat. And all the best players play it. There's actually an expression in poker, which is that the worst day of a tournament player's career is the day he busts from the main event. Um, around this time, somebody had come up with a technological innovation for televised poker, which was called whole card cameras. Now, whole card cameras are those little cameras that let the TV audience see each of the player's hands. Now, before that, if you can believe it, poker was televised, but it was excruciatingly boring to watch because you couldn't follow along. Finally now, you know, people at home could you know, be engaged and invested in the suspense and the drama of the poker tournament. They actually had more information than the players themselves because they could see all of the players' hands in each hand. And it became much more interesting and, and, um, and much more viable to tell them about. So Chris Moneymaker takes his seat and goes on this incredible run of cards, ends up winning the tournament, becoming world champion, turning his $200 investment into $2 million, fulfilling the kind of American dream, and in the process beating some of the best players in the world. Now, this was actually so influential, it was really a watershed moment in development of poker. It led to this huge poker boom that, um, that happened a lot on the internet, and then live tournaments got bigger too. Um, but part of the reason for that was because what Chris Moneymaker illustrated was this fundamental truth about poker, one of the things that I think is so interesting and so unique about it, and that really doesn't exist in almost any other sphere of competition. And that is that amateur players, casual players, have a shot, they have a legitimate chance at competing with, and sometimes even beating, the best players in the world. And so if you think about it, like, I don't know your tennis level, but if you were to be on the court with Roger Federer, you'd probably be lucky to win a single point, right? And there'd be at no point at which the outcome of the match would be in question. I grew up playing competitive chess, and if I was playing chess against Magnus Carlsen, the greatest chess player in the world, he could probably take his queen off the board, play me blindfolded, and I would still never have a chance of beating him. That is how large the gap is in the vast majority of competitive spheres between the professional players, the best players in the world, and amateur players. But in poker, that's, that's just not how it works. And I think we all understand the reason for that is because of luck, right? The element of luck and how it works in poker. Now, a lot of people understand that poker involves luck, but I don't think they understand necessarily how exactly it works. One of the ways that I like to explain it to people is that basically luck, as a determining factor in outcomes, is inversely related to the number of poker hands that you play. So, for example, if Vasu and I were to play one hand of heads-up poker, which is one-on-one -on -one poker, luck would be an overwhelmingly dominant factor in determining who won. But as we played more hands, 10, 20, 100 hands, luck would start to diminish in terms of its importance in determining who won. 
And there would be a point at which, in theory, luck would completely cease being a determining factor. And in statistics, and in poker in particular, that's called reaching the long term. Now, in poker, the long term is a lot of hands, right? We're not talking about hundreds or even thousands of hands. We're talking literally hundreds of thousands of hands and beyond. Now, the only context, or the main context, in which you're going to play that many hands, you're going to reach the long term, is by playing on the internet. Now, again, after Chris Moneymaker won, poker exploded, and especially online. Now, internet poker basically changed the game. It revolutionized the way the game was played, and it did a couple of things. One, it brought an entire new group of people who would otherwise never have kind of taken poker seriously. I am a member of that group. If when I was learning poker, I had to go to a shady underground club or go to a casino every time I wanted to play poker, I probably would have thought it was a fun game. I probably would have played a couple times a year, but I never would have taken it as seriously as I did. I never would have studied it and really tried to become very good at it. But because I could play as much as I wanted from the comfort of my own home, I, I took to it. I really studied it, and I tried to get as good as possible. Now, like I said, when I grew up, I was playing competitive chess. I played a couple musical instruments, and like Basu said, I was really into sports. I played basketball and tennis, and I ran track actually very seriously. So I had these kind of models for myself of what it meant to try to get really good at something. And especially this kind of sense that you know, once you apply yourself at something and you start to see improvement, that that improvement itself serves as additional motivation you get this sense of pride, of accomplishment from improving, and that serves to reinforce your attempt to continue to work. And that kind of virtuous circle for me kind of helped me continue to be motivated and continue to work on my game. Now, I also had some other inherent advantages when I was learning poker. I was always strong in math, and math and, and poker is really a combination of applied statistics and psychology, so that really helped. I also, when I graduated college, I actually didn't play poker until I was like 24 or 25, which is different from a lot of other professional players, but um, I actually feel pretty grateful of that. If I had found poker when I was in college or before, I'm not even sure I would finish college. That's how consuming the kind of getting into poker can be and, and, and was for me, actually. Um, but I graduated college with a philosophy degree, and a lot of people kid with me about, well, about humanities degrees in general, but uh, philosophy in particular about how irrelevant that kind of became for me in my job. But I actually think that in the early years, and especially in the early stage of learning poker, philosophy was particularly relevant, and the reason it's because in addition to playing poker, the way that I learned and, and ended up getting good was by reading. And at the time, because the internet had changed poker so much, poker books that were out there were essentially written by people who really weren't all that great in poker. It had essentially passed those people by, and the best players were young guys on the internet who were using kind of crossover-esque software-based analytical tools to kind of advance poker theory and poker strategy. And then they were discussing it with each other through this medium of the internet, basically talking in online poker strategy form. And so there was one form in particular, it's called 2 plus 2, that's where I learned, um, reading strategy threads. Now a strategy thread is essentially somebody posts a hand or a theoretical concept, other people respond with their opinions, and then an online conversation ensues from there. And what philosophy teaches you, philosophy essentially teaches you to think critically and then ultimately to think independently. And the way it does that is by helping you learn to deconstruct and then reconstruct arguments to distinguish between good and not so good arguments. And then ultimately to be able to come up with coherent and, and, and cogent arguments of your own. So in my process of reading these threads and of kind of trying to navigate this, what ended up being this sea of different people's opinions about what was good, what was bad, what was theoretically optimal and all of this stuff, this kind of argument training helped me to kind of pick and choose the best elements of what people were saying and end up developing my own strategy. Because at the end of the day, if all you can do is like kind of read and then repeat, you're going to be limited in terms of your improvement. And that's probably true in not just poker, but I, I found it to be particularly true in poker. What you need to be able to do is to really genuinely learn, which means you can apply the concept that you learn in new ways. Really think for yourself. And um, especially in poker, where you're, you're confronted with all these different situations. And another element of poker that's relevant to that is that, you know, unlike chess, for example, you know, in chess I can come up with a position, not really be sure what to do about it, then present it to an expert or even a computer. And though the computational question itself might be difficult, ultimately, most of the time, you'll come up with a, a best play, a best move, one that will most likely result in a winning game. But in poker, it's not really like that. There are a number of reasons why. Partly is because 
there's some information that's hidden that you might never get. Your opponent's cards, the cards that come. It's a human game in the sense that your opponent's reactions to what you will do and his plays in the future are somewhat random and unpredictable. So you never really know how he's going to respond. And then it's not constructed in the way chess is in terms of having these kind of short goals of winning this game, winning that game. It's more of an overall strategy that's relevant. So instead of having best moves, what you end up doing is you have these kind of viable options. And so one of the things that kind of learning poker trained me to do was to learn how to think in terms of trade-offs. Kind of picking among a bunch of viable options, doing a trade-off analysis of pros and cons, and then ultimately picking the best move and understanding why. Because if you don't understand why, then you don't really understand what you're doing. And there's actually a term for people who play online who don't understand what they're doing, and it's called clicking buttons. People are just randomly clicking buttons. And, and the thing is, <coughs> clicking buttons can work sometimes, right? I mean, that's why luck is such an important factor, because no matter how good or badly you play, sometimes you'll still end up winning. So, not just, you know, poker helped me in terms of figuring out how to think in terms of trade-offs, but there was, you know, another way that poker helped, I, I noticed the way that poker kind of influenced the way I was thinking, not just about poker tough, but about kind of life in general. And that had to do with understanding the difference between process and outcome. And more importantly, understanding the, you know, the, the seeming connect and disconnect between those two. So like, for example, if you're a basketball coach, right, and you want your basketball team, your goal is for them to improve as much as possible, win as many games as possible. You know, you might film the game, submit it to crossover, get some statistical and analysis breakdown, and then use that in your review process to help understand your strengths, your weaknesses, what you're doing right, and how you can improve, right? And that review process is similar in poker. It's very similar. But there is one important difference, and that is, again, this connection or disconnection in poker between outcomes and process. Now, in, 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 most, in most instances, the connection, I think, is closer than it is in poker. I think we all have this kind of cognitive bias to overestimate the connection between outcome and process. But in poker, you're specifically trained to essentially ignore it. And the reason, again, is because of luck, right? So I, I actually noticed this once as I, as I got more into poker and live poker, I ended up doing some poker commentary. And so in doing poker commentary, I was watching poker on TV and being specifically attuned to what uh, poker commentators themselves were saying as I was preparing to be one. And all the time you would hear, or I would hear, you know, I would see the situations where somebody would make a play that I thought was not particularly great. But if it would work out in the situation, the poker commentator would, you know, keep credit and praise onto the player. Like, oh, what a great call, what a, what a, what a great bluff. And I'd be there screaming at the TV like, that was terrible, like, what are you talking about? You just got lucky, you just happened to work in that particular situation. But again, I think it's because we all naturally make this connection between process and outcome. And so, you know, if you hear two professional players discussing a hand or discussing a situation, very often you'll hear them discuss the potential hands their opponents could have, the potential hands that they would have in that same situation. And secondarily, maybe sometimes even totally ignored, is what actually happened in the hand, what, you know, who won the hand or what your opponent actually had, because that's really not the point, right? The point is the process, how you play. And so, what that led me to was another kind of realization, at least about myself, and I think it's relatively universal. But it's something called, I mean, at least I call it, I call it emotional anti-fragility. Now, it's a complicated sounding word. Um, anti-fragile is a term introduced by this guy, Nassem Taleb, who's a well-known author. He's written books like Black Swan and um, Fooled by Randomness, thank you. Um, and he wrote this book called Anti-Fragile. And he introduced this term, anti-fragile. The reason he did it was because he was looking for antonyms to the word fragile, and he found no really great candidates. And if you think about it, something is fragile, a piece of glass, for example, is fragile. Because as it gets stressed, it gets weaker, and then potentially breaks. And so words that could be candidates for antonyms, something like strength or resilience, they sound good at first, but when you think about it, they're really not great antonyms. And the reason is because if something is resilient, then that means it can withstand stress. But that's not really the opposite of fragile. The opposite of fragile is something that when it gets stressed, gets stronger. Right? So if you think of the mythological creature of a hydra, right? you cut off one head and two pop up. Or the concept behind working out. You tear your muscles so that when they regrow, they rebuild themselves bigger and stronger. Right? That's, an, that's an example of something being anti-fragile. When it's stress, disorder, chaos, stress, doesn't just you know, not affect it, it actually makes it stronger. Right, I think there are some like villains who are like that, right? The Hulk, I think, is like that. Um, and so what I noticed about myself, and this again has to do with the, the connect and 
in poker especially, the disconnect between process and outcome, is that when you're a professional poker player, I've played like four or five million hands of poker in my life. What you end up experiencing, no matter how good you are, is these incredibly long and tortuous sessions of losing. You just can't avoid it. There's nothing you can avoid. And you know, you want to kind of describe the losing to bad luck. But because it's a game that only has partial information in it, because you never really know all the time what your opponent has or what was going to happen. There always leaves a kind of question mark in your head, like, why am I losing? Is this, is this person playing better than me? Like, am I playing poorly? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, can bad luck really last this long? Can it affect me this much? And so it ends up playing emotional games with you, or at least it did with me. The strategic, the analytical part of poker always came relatively easy to me. And when, poker, when people describe poker as a combination between applied statistics and psychology, I think a lot of times the psychological aspect that they're talking about is kind of an interpersonal one. It's like if I'm playing against you, I'm trying to understand your emotional and psychological state and then trying to exploit that as I play. But what they ignore and what's, I think, at least equally if not more important is the internal psychological state that's relevant. And that has to do with self-awareness, with self-discipline, and ultimately with self-control. And the reason it's so important is because as people go through these bouts of losing, these inevitable, long, very difficult and frustrating sessions of losing, it can mess with your head. It can mess with you emotionally as you get frustrated, as you start to question yourself and you lose confidence. It can affect the way that you play. Now in poker there's a term for that, it's called tilt. And tilt, at least for me, was a especially difficult challenge. I used to lose it. And what I learned about myself was that I was emotionally anti-fragile. Which means that as I went through these experiences, I got stronger, I got better, and I was able to withstand more losing, more bad luck. It would take more of it for me to reach the same point. I ended up actually working at it, I ended up <clears throat> seeing a therapist, I ended up taking up meditation, meditation was actually particularly helpful, um, and I ended up trying to focus on the process and not the outcome. But ultimately, I actually feel like at this point, it's become a strength in my game. Having this, I always want to use the word resiliency, but it's more than that. You know, having this ability to withstand um, bad luck, adversity. And I, and I feel like it's, it's um, I feel like it's been for me a wider experience than just poker. I feel like in life in general now, when things happen that are out of my control, I'm able to focus more on the things that I can control, on my actual choices, the things that I deserve credit for and blame for, not the things that I can't control and, and don't have any ability to change. And so I feel very grateful personally for those experiences and to know that I don't know if I handle them amazing, but I know that I handle them better than I otherwise would have if I didn't play poker. So you know, I, I, I wanted to kind of stop there and you know, having shared a couple things about my experiences in poker, my, you know, my, my ideas of what playing poker for a living are like and what I kind of like about it, um, I know that there's probably a number of people, of kind of a wide range of people's interest and engagement in poker. So I, I wanted to, if there were questions, if there were things that people were curious about me or about the game or they wanted to talk about, you know, please feel free to ask me. You know, I have, you know, in this context, obviously, or I'll be around after if people want to talk individually. Um, but I, I hope this was entertaining and a little bit enlightening for you guys. So are there any questions? Is anybody curious? All of you have lost money. Oh. So. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I actually got into uh, poker kind of the same way. Okay. And, uh, I played on party poker all the time when I first grew up. So yeah, did, you, did you make... Uh, a good run on part poker before it shut down. Um, you, yeah. What do you think about the internet um, poker scene? I guess in general. Well, yeah, I, I did play on party for a while. I uh, I ended up moving over to Full Tilt. Actually, my I lived in a doorman building, and my doorman was like, "Yo, have you heard this new site, Full Tilt Poker?" <laughs> and I was like, "Really?" He was like, "Yeah, check it out." And I just thought the software itself was a little bit more like a video game. It was more fun, so I, I moved to Full Tilt and, and played from there. And then I played on Poker Stars a lot. The one of the issues with online poker, you know, I don't know if you guys know the kind of legislative environment related to it, but in the U.S. it's become, it's not really illegal, but the site, the major sites themselves have stopped um, processing um, and allowing American players to play. I actually have an apartment in Toronto that I go and play um, from. But um, the competitive environment, I mean, poker's gotten 
online poker's gotten incredibly competitive. And that's for really for two reasons. One is this, like I said, this crossover-esque based analytical software has really changed the game and people have become very, very good very quickly. And especially when you can play a large amount of hands, you can get this huge database and like Vasa like said, it's, it's, it's all about data. Like the numbers don't lie. So um, another thing that happens is because the, in the long term, luck becomes relevant as a factor and you can reach the long term much faster online, what ends up happening is the, the money ends up consolidating to the better players very quickly. Now in a live game, because you're playing so many fewer hands, luck is a much bigger factor, and so money can spread around in the same absolute amount of time much easier. But what's ended up happening basically is that games have dried up a little bit, um, and, game, and players have gotten very good. Um, I think it's still profitable, but um, what ended up happening was ended up happening is you have to if you don't continue to improve, then you end up getting left behind. So I've had to kind of find ways to continue to improve and to stay motivated to do so. So you talk about how resilient you are. Uh, I'm a big believer in mental toughness too. Uh, we can be sitting there making hundreds of cold calls a day. No one's answering our phone calls. Can't make a sale or whatever. Uh, what do you do when you're in poker games, taking hours and hours, things just aren't going your way? What keeps you mentally tough? So that's that's a, that's a great question. I I actually believe um, strongly in um, in quitting. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I don't want to explain what that means. <laughs> 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 so in, in poker, quitting essentially means that uh, you stop for the time being when you think things are not going your way. When you get, when you feel yourself getting discouraged. Now I think there's two elements here. One is, you know, how do you prevent yourself from getting discouraged? And then the other is, once you get, you know, once you've legitimately kind of exhausted your possibilities, do you continue um, kind of trying to do something that you know is is just not, is a kind of a losing proposition. So that's what I mean by quitting in poker, it's important not to play when you know that, um, or when you get sense that you're gonna kind of start to play poorly. Um, but in general, you know, I have intellectual exercises like focusing on process and on outcome. Knowing that the bigger picture is about, um, is essentially, in poker, profitability is not related, is basically the only thing it's really related to assuming you are profitable, is related to volume. You don't make po you don't make money in poker by making these incredible plays. You make it by con consistently putting in the effort. And so whether you like, I, I, I used to I used to think about people that I would lose to or situations where I would lose, and I would think in, not in terms of actual dollars, but in terms of theoretical dollars. It was like no matter what happens, the more I play, the more I'll win. So the more I work, the more I win. And it's even if it's not tangible real money. Again, as long as I continue to have faith in myself and my strategy, that you, you know, essentially your EV lines up with your actual money. So like the money that you should make in theory playing poker over the long run will end up matching up with the amount of money that you actually make. It'll take a long time, You'll, it'll be a really swingy experience, but as long as you can kind of, in your mind, you know, have that sense in yourself, that confidence in what you're doing, then you, that can kind of help motivate you through the dark times, the tough periods, the frustrating times. So what's your uh, philosophy on changing your game? Like, what if you're playing a far superior player? Well, example? if you're playing a far superior player, you should probably not play him. <laughs> um, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless, 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 unless you're playing him purposefully for the, um, uh, to try to improve. I think that's actually a very valuable thing to do. In my own game, I've noticed like my skill level has kind of gone like this, jump up, go like this, jump up, go like this. And every time I've had this kind of breakthrough theoretically in my understanding of the game, it's always been after getting my ass kicked by somebody who was better than me. Um, so I think it's actually very valuable to compete with people who are better than you. It helps you improve. I think you should do it one, you know, some people kind of tilt and then use that as an excuse. So you have to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and not kind of come up with the reason afterwards. Um, so that's one. Two, you have to make sure that you can afford it because these lessons can be expensive, especially because better players tend to be playing for lots of money. Um, but three, let's say you're, and I think maybe this is more direct to your question, let's say you're in a situation where you're forced to play someone and they're very good and you're not really sure what to do. Um, I would say you should try to up the variance. And so upping the variance in poker essentially <coughs> means taking slightly more risks, putting your opponents in situations where you think he's less kind of um, less used to. So like a lot of times in poker there are certain rhythms to hands. It goes like, you know, raise, call, check, bet, call, something like that. So you can kind of try to break up those rhythms, lead out into your opponent, uh, make larger or smaller than normal size raises, 
um, just kind of do things that are going to be a little bit out of his kind of expectation range. Ultimately, that can be a dangerous strategy, but if you've already kind of conceded that your opponent is superior in skill, you should try to up the variance to give yourself the best possible chance, even if you're never going to get kind of a better chance. And, and a more conservative route when you're playing a far less superior opponent, or should you play your game? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think a more conservative route, if you want to talk in these very general terms, makes sense. I think the problem is that poker is so style specific that less superior is not really, you know, it's, it's not specific enough in terms of like what it is about the player that, you know, their weaknesses. I think what I try to do is I try to figure out specifically what my opponents do that's theoretically deficient and then cater a style that specifically exploits those weaknesses. So, I mean, if you can do that, that I think is the best way to do it. And, and I would say because of that, because that's my overall strategy, I don't actually have a style. Like I have a default. My default is to play the way a, I would train a computer to play. It's this game theory based, like optimal, you know, strategy. But I actually don't think it's nearly as optimal against the vast majority of opponents because it doesn't. It's not specific to their theoretical efficiency. So uh, you mentioned earlier, I think, to, to Albert's question about the, the internet and the role it's played and kind of where we're at today. Yeah. Um, so, like, before it all went down, the, the, the site started, like, mm -hmm. just, the, the, you couldn't really play as a, you know, as, as a U.S., uh, somebody that's in the U.S. Um, you know, I played casually. I didn't really get super into it because I was busy working or whatever sure. it is. So what, what do you, in the current state of, I guess, where poker's at, what do you recommend, like, a, a player like myself, very, very casual, um, that wants to learn more about it and get kind of more on that theory side. What do you recommend that somebody like that would do, um, given the current state of poker? Because I think you mentioned that it's kind of like, if you didn't learn it back in those days and got really good, it's you, you kind of missed out because it's the evolution of online poker is now this way, where it's very hard for new people to get in. So like, yeah, I, I would say I would say well, one, it's definitely I. I if, if I if I implied that I think that people missed out, I, that that was wrong of me. Oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't mean to imply that. I actually think in a lot of ways people now have a lot of advantages in terms of learning and that's because there have been there's been this actually big poker industry that's popped up that's based on coaching and teaching um, so there's actually a lot more information and it's a lot more it's a lot better and a lot more relevant than it was so there's a number of different poker training sites where they have videos you can become members and kind of learn the way people think and, and the way people play so I think those are those are very valuable I continue to think poker forums in general are good places to to kind of read about um, different people's kind of theories and, and understandings. I, I think there probably are a couple poker books out there that are a little bit better, especially for tournaments. Uh, a friend of mine named Jonathan Little has, read, has written a few books based on tournaments that I think are, um, are pretty good, especially for people who, um, like you said, are like a little bit more casual and kind of just want to get a higher understanding. And then, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the best way to learn is by playing. Um, there are still a couple of sites where you can play. Um, uh, I think Carbon Poker is one, um, and there are a couple of other smaller ones. Um, and again, it's it's not illegal for individuals to play. It's the sites themselves that take risks. But the, the majority of the sites that operate in in, in, in the U.S. still are um, are smaller operations offshore. So people are not really that concerned. They're not going to come back to the U.S. and they're not big enough operations for the DOJ to really go after them. Slowly, online poker is coming back to the U.S. It's legal now in Nevada. It's legal in New Jersey. It's legal in Delaware. Um, the problem is that these are small markets, and so th there's not a huge amount of um, traffic. But eventually, more sites, more sites will legalize, and then um, more states will legalize, and then they will com they will make form contacts with each other, and the markets will get bigger. Right. So, do you find that online for somebody new is the way to go versus Oh yeah, person? sorry. Yeah, and I think online the, the main reason online is better is because one, you're, you'll find better, tougher competition online, and then two, you can just play that many more hands. Right. I mean, I, in the first year that I played serious poker online, I probably played the same number of hands that a full-time live professional plays in 15 or 20 years. In the first two year, two or three years that I played, I probably played more hands than Doyle Brunson played in his whole life. Um, and that's just, you know, there are a number of different reasons, right? I mean, you don't have to wait for the dealer to deal and shuffle. You don't have to, you know, every person's decision is limited by a certain amount of time. Everything's automated, and then you can play multiple games simultaneously. I mean, people, with some of these, some of this helpful analytical software now, there are some people playing 15, 20, 25 tables at once. Um, then obviously that takes time, and a lot of them are, are, have been doing it for a long time. But again, you can play a lot of hands in a short period of time, and that that experience has really helped people improve and get better. Last, last one, sorry. Sure. This is very interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, so with all those differences in online versus real life, I mean, what is what is 
like some of the bigger differences that you need to account for. So if like if I'm some dude that's playing in my apartment all the time, and then I try to go to the Borgata Atlantic City, which has happened to me, and I just I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Like, what are things that I need to teach myself yeah. to not be a complete idiot at the Borgata at eight o'clock at night on Saturday? Well, I would say first of all, have confidence in yourself right. because. Um, there's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the etiquette, like, and all the, like the, the right. speed, and you know. yeah. So I, I would say, um, you know, there's there was this like I don't know if it still exists. I think it's probably the gap is probably much wider now. But there was this kind of um, I don't know what the word is, but this, I guess symmetry in terms of skill level, um, where I think you had to go up like three or four times the stakes live to reach the same skill level that you were playing online. So if you're playing kind of similar stakes live that you're playing online, I think from a skill point of view, you should be totally fine. I would say one of the problems that I had, um, and and you know when I, when I played, one of the initial problems I had when I played live was that I overestimated my opponents. I thought that, and this is actually kind of a common psychological dynamic I learned, but it's like when people people who are very knowledgeable about a subject tend to overestimate other people's knowledge about that same subject because they kind of put their own uh, points of view into the other, into other people's minds. So you might think that you have no idea what you're doing, but it might be the other people that really have no idea what they're doing. And so if you kind of stick with the... That's what was happening. If you stick with the game and have confidence in yourself, I, I'm, I'm confident that you'll... Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Go ahead. I'm staying in uh, You mentioned you were also like a big time chess player. Well, I don't want big time. Well, whatever. But I mean, you, yeah, you, 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 you have a basketball player. But I'm, curious, I'm just curious to, to see, you, you touched on a couple of sort of similarities and differences between the, the two philosophies involved in the mm -hmm. games. Um, what would you say are the, are the main similarities and differences that, that playing poker as well as playing chess well, have taught you? Because I know you touched on um, poker. There, there seems like there's almost a little bit of solace to be taken in the fact that you can rest assured that the process was, was good enough that the, the ends may not have worked out, but you know the process is right, and you can assume that numerically it'll come back around to you. Right, so that, that faith that's necessary for poker is really not necessary for chess, right. because there's essentially no luck in chess. Um, so along with that faith, that kind of emotional anti-fragility is not really that relevant in chess. When you lose a game in chess, you can analyze it and figure out exactly why you lost, how you could have won the game, um, and learn from that experience and, and, and make it an entirely positive experience from that point of view. Um, you know, my sense also is that kind of chess and poker have similar skill sets that are necessary. Poker's skill set is a little bit wider and a little bit less deep, and po the chess's skill set is a little bit narrower and considerably more deep. So chess takes, I think, a considerable more amount of study, um, a more amount of like memorization, for example. like. I, I, I used to watch chess videos by, by masters and they would be in a position and then just have already memorized four different games that are 20 moves deep that have gone out, you know, like, you know, trees from that original position. And like, they remember in like five years ago, this master played this master and this is what happened. I mean, it's like, it's like unbelievable. You're just right. like, wow, this person must have been born with some incredible talent like that. I think poker is less kind of demanding of one particular skill like that, but has a wider range of skills. So this kind of psychological self-awareness, this self-discipline that's necessary. There's also a lot of study involved, but again, it's, I think it's a little bit less deep. And would you say that there's a little bit more, poker's almost done a better service to you in an overall philosophical outlook on, on living life in general? Because Yeah, I think it's taught me a wider range of lessons. And I, I mean, at the same time, though, you know, I, it's hard for me to compare because I was into chess and studied it and, and played competitively until I was like 11 or 12. Right. But I just it never got to the same level as I did with poker. So and I was much younger, so I had much. It was a, my learning was going to be much different when I was 10. Obviously, when I was, when I was 25, 30. So it was it was very different. But I think um, because it challenges a wider range and because there's this kind of emotional aspect to it, which at least for me was tougher. Um, it was like you know I was like plugging the leak more. You know I was like hitting one of my weaknesses more with poker than I was with chess. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so it seems like Hollywood kind of glamorizes more like the tell and everything yes, in does. poker. Yes, it does. Uh, so is that really not as big of a deal at all? Like yeah. So I, there's a, there's a little bit of disagreement in the poker community about yeah. this. Uh, I come from playing online, so I'm kind of a little bit more skeptical of live tells than people who have been playing live poker for 20 or 30 years. Obviously, when you hope that's all right. Obviously, when you uh, when you watch James Bond movies, you know. It's not really a true representation of, sure. of what's going on. Um, 
but yeah, I think I think physical talent is uh, dramatically overhyped and oversold as as a factor in poker. I think it does exist. I think what's more relevant though, um, and this is a genuine difference between live and online poker, is the live <laughs> dynamic does add a new element. Now again, it's not going to be based on a guy scratching his nose or twitching his ear, but when you're next to a guy, you know when you can look at him. And again, a lot of times these situations are very stressful. People feel a lot of pressure. There's a lot of money on the line, um, especially deep in tournaments. You can get a sense for a player. And over time, doing it for a long time, you get better at, and some people will just naturally be better, at kind of determining what that presence would mean. You know, if I, you know, if I can kind of divide the groups of potential hands that you have into very, very strong hands and bluffs, then I know that if I can pick up genuine, a genuine level of comfort or a genuine level of discomfort from you, that it's much more likely to be in one or the other category. Now, professionals are going to be very good at deceiving you, at trying to create an impression that's maybe the opposite of what you expect, or maybe it is what you expect, so you think it's the opposite. I mean, there's all these kind of games that go back and forth. But on some level, right, and this is going to be true of professionals and especially of amateurs, there's going to be something that you probably have a very difficult time hiding. Right? And so you see a lot of times guys wear hoodies, they wear sunglasses. And you know, originally when poker was shown in, in movies and TV shows and stuff, this was how a lot of poker players were, were shown. But over time, I think a lot of people started to see hiding as a sign of weakness. Um, and people who were able to just kind of be out there and just be like, I have nothing to hide, it was more seen as a sign of strength. Um, I think it probably does help some people to hide. Um, some people's necks just go wild, you know? <laughs> um, now, it's, again, it's, sometimes it's hard to figure out what that means, but that's what, you know, playing a lot of live poker helps you, um, helps you. And again, it doesn't have to, you know, you see people sometimes and they make these crazy plays, and then they just, they just like, oh, I had this live tell. It's like, okay, that's mostly nonsense. But in poker, poker is a game of very, very, very marginal edges. Um, very slight the edges that you're trying to exploit over time. So if you can get you know, just something small that helps you make your decision incrementally. You know, that's, you, you take all the information, all of the advantages that you can get. Anyone else? Sure. Um, you said that uh, people are using like analytic software to help them play online. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember back then, like when it first started blowing up, uh, there were a lot of bots just playing automatically, right. like, taking the money. Yeah. But the, the sites knew that they were bots. So what's different? Like, if someone played just analytically with the software, like, how does that? Or, or is why is like, that? How is that like different from a bot? Or, Sorry, what did you say? Or, or is that like a problem to like so, to figure okay. out who's who? And so, so the issue, the issue of bots is is a relevant issue. I think in the beginning, sites kind of weren't sure how to deal with it, um, and you know, it costs money to try to track it and enforce bans on it. Um, but ultimately, I think bots threaten the very integrity of the game. And um, when you threaten the integrity of the game, you really threaten an entire poker site's business model. So ultimately, sites started to decide, look, we can't let this happen. And they devoted genuine resources to rooting out bots. And so um, I think bots probably have gotten much better <laughs> um, over time. But at the same time, the sites have been much more rigorous about um, finding them and banning them and, and penalizing the, the account holders that are associated with them. So I, I, I also think poker, it's, it's weird. I, I've had this discussion many times, and I, I'm still not exactly sure how to explain why this is. But um, computers have simply not been able to figure out how to play poker that well. right? I mean, people know about the experience with Deep Blue. Deep Blue played you know, Kasparov, and, and then a, now computer, you can buy a computer that's better than the best chess player in the world, or you know, very close, for you know, a dollar or an app for five dollars or something like that. Um, so again, it's some one of the differences between chess and poker, but um, poker is just not the kind of game where um, computers have figured out how to play that well. And even if they do figure out how to play that well, there's going to be an entirely kind of next step after that. Because once computers can play what's essentially called optimal poker, it's called game theoretical poker, which is quote unquote unbeatable or unexploitable poker, there's a big, big gap between that and playing um, actually optimal poker. because. If a, like, like I said, my default style is to try to approach something like that. But once I figure out a bit of my opponent's weaknesses, then I adjust my style to try to exploit that. 
So to get a computer to play optimal poker is a huge enough challenge in itself. To get it to learn and then adjust to its opponents is going to be an entirely new task. So. Go ahead. Regardless of your position on the table or your stack and party, aside from say your bullets or cowboys, is there a hand that you like to play that you particularly like suit connectors or something that you you actually grow fond of that maybe is a non traditional play? English. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I would say um, I, I try to like I, I try to stay away from from thinking in terms of like I guess um, I, I basically try to focus on thinking in terms of equity. So, uh, and what that means in the poker context is like what hands are going to net me the most equity based on the situation that I'm in. So, um, yeah, I do play some non-traditional hands in the sense that I'll play like seven eight suited or nine ten suited or pocket threes or something like that from an early position or whatever. But it's always because of some strategic. It's always part of my overall game plan. I'll, I'll never do something. I mean, I might, I might, I do believe in intuitive flashes. I do think that sometimes people can get cued into things that are above strategy. I do think that's possible, and I do think that happens from time to time. But I'll never say, um, I really like the way this hand looks, I'm gonna play it. You know what I mean? I, I, I never do anything like that, I just think you're just setting money on fire when you do that. What else? Yeah, I'll start Thanks, man.